Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this evening. Appreciate you being here again. And um, special night for us. It's not a uh, normal service for us when we observe the Lord's table. Just do it uh, a few times a year. Try not to do it too frequently. I know some churches have it more frequent than we do. Some churches do it weekly. Uh, some churches observe the Lord's table maybe on a monthly basis. I have been accused before maybe not observing it enough times for some people's taste. But my fear is always that I don't want it to become a routine or part of our, you know, we struggle with that in churches. Of Amen. Things becoming normal and routine. Uh, we come in and sing so many songs, we do this, and I, as one service, I don't want to be routine. One message, I don't want to be routine, that we, we would lose its significance. And so uh, that's my reason behind that, and perhaps, uh, and maybe I'm wrong in that time, maybe it would be better off for us to observe it more frequently and make more of it, make much of it. Uh, but we are commanded in the Bible to remember this ordinance. Uh, along with uh, this ordinance, we believe there's one other ordinance for the local church, that's the ordinance of baptism. And we've been talking about that here recently as we've been discussing on uh, Sunday nights uh, why, what, about the, uh, why we're Baptists and, and so forth. And that was one of our things that we, we've touched on thus far, the two ordinances of the local church are Lord's Supper and baptism. Both of them very, very important. Both of them to be observed. Um, to, to not be a part of this uh, would uh, uh, be in disobedience and would, would make you in disobedience with the Lord. And so I remember I had a, uh, an individual in our church in Pennsylvania that um, they just would not observe this. And, uh, and after speaking with them at some point, they said, well, not everything's right with me and some folks. And, and I felt like and uh, they just weren't willing to make things right. And what of them that they understood the, the significance of it and not to partake of this if you're sin in your life, but might to ignore a wonderful thing simply because you didn't want to take care of some sin in your life. Uh, what, a, what a terrible thing. And I encourage that person to get those things taken care of. And certainly I would you as well. Well, Paul addresses the church of Corinth here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Concerning the misuse, the mistreatment of the Lord's Supper, uh, they were not observing it correctly. And um, so Paul is correcting them on it because he has, a, as he has much stuff uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's a book, book of correction. Uh, there's a church that was full of potential, uh, but boy, they, they had a lot of issues. And so much of 1 Corinthians is corrections. 2 Corinthians is oftentimes a book of praise for them correcting, uh, uh, getting those things corrected. And that was good. And it is possible to receive correction and to receive it properly and to deal with it properly. Amen? Amen. That's the way we should. Um, when you're not doing something correctly, your pride is going to want to say, oh, I'll do it my own way. I'm all right. Um, but the best thing for us to do is to humble ourselves and say, okay, I was incorrect in this matter. And I'm going to, from this point out, uh, from this point on, try to do things the, the correct way. So let's pick up reading here in verse number 20. So when you come together, therefore, in the one place, it is not to be the Lord's Supper. For needing every one taken before other his own supper, one is hungry and another is drunken. One have you not houses to eat and to drink in, and despise you the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I uh, praise you in this? I praise you not. It seems like they were taking the term and these the title and the event of the Lord's table, uh, the, uh, as we are remembering that last night with Jesus with his disciples in the upper room, and they partook of bread and partook of the drink. And but they were using almost as an excuse just to have fellowship and get together and, and uh, almost like a food fellowship like we might have. And Paul says this is incorrect. This is the wrong way to handle this. Verse 23 says, For I have received the Lord, which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new test in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do you show the Lord of death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily 
shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And that word sleep there is not describing, you know, someone that's struggling with uh, exhaustion and falling asleep. It's talking about death. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. If ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Tonight, as we will be prepared to receive this in just a moment here, I want us to first of all be sure that we're doing this tonight for the proper reasons, and that is as a remembrance or a memorial. Uh, tonight we are in no way believing that some type of mystical or supernatural event will take place with these elements tonight. Mm -hmm. That this juice will suddenly become the blood of Jesus, or that the bread will become a the body of Jesus. In no in no form or shape are we doing that in that fashion tonight. Our purpose, our goal, our motive is one full night for remembrance, for a memorial, that we look back upon what took place for us on the cross of Calvary. Uh, remembrance is a good thing. Memorializing is a good thing. Uh, certain events in our lives and certain in our history, uh, for us to look back upon those things, certainly not to forget. I remember reading about whoever was in charge of World War II, the generals, Eisenhower, whoever it may have been, MacArthur, they uh, were they were uh, relieving many of the Jewish uh, individuals and the different Christians and the ones that were in the concentration camps. And he said, uh, I want to take as many pictures of this as possible. And his purpose was, is I don't want this to ever be forgotten that this took place here. I don't want anybody to ever think that this was uh, some made-up thing, like some that crazy guy in Iran is trying to say that it never happened. And, and so he says, I want these pictures taken. Out. So we'll remember, and there's countless and, and hundreds and thousands of pictures as photographers came in and took the picture of these men and women and living in these deplorable conditions and, and, and starving to death, and their bodies showing that. And, and, and he wanted those things to be memorialized, to be remembered. Now, in that way, it's certainly a, a very difficult topic. But do you understand what I'm speaking of this evening? It's good for us to remember. It's good right. for us to remember a lot of things. I can say you can remember the day you got saved. Yeah. Um, you know, you may not remember the date. You may not remember uh, all the particular details, but you ought to have that moment. That, might, that, that, that should be a moment where you remember what took place. You're clear on it. You understand what took place. There's no doubt about it in your heart and your mind. I trust that you remember those things. I trust that you have some real spiritual mountaintop experiences that you can look back on and you can remember. Remember how God worked, how God did some things in your life or in a church service. Or, you know, remember. I really pray that we have some events like that in our church in the days to come. And we can look back on it. So that was good. That was great how God worked. That was wonderful what the Lord did there. Yeah. We can remember those things. But there's nothing far more important and certainly nothing that like this that we've been commanded to do that would be greater to remember than what Jesus did for you and for me at Calvary. Man. Um, certainly we don't have snapshots of it. No pictures, no videos. But we certainly have the Word of God that tells us we have the Spirit of God that dwells in our hearts and teaches us, brings all things to our remembrance. Let us not forget the great, great, sweet sacrifice that the Lord Jesus had for us that day at Mount Calvary. Tonight we'll observe two elements. The bread, representing the body of Jesus Christ, and then also the, the juice this evening, the grape juice that we'll be receiving, uh, uh, memorializing the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed there on Mount Calvary. Let us remember that. But I also want us tonight to be very clear about who should be taking the Lord's Supper. Who should be observing the Lord's Supper. First and foremost, we'll start with, this is a 
This is a, uh, an ordinance to be remembered, first of all, by born again people. People that have a clear testimony that they know Jesus Christ is their personal Savior. Not only should they have a clear testimony of this, it's an ordinance for the church. And to be a part of the local church, you have to be baptized. Now, you can attend the local church, but you can't be a member of the local church without being baptized. That's what uh, signifies you and makes you a member of the church. Now, we do receive other baptisms that are scriptural, uh, that were performed in a, in, a, in a proper manner by immersion, uh, that were performed in a church that would be uh, uh, consistent with the teaching and the doctrine of our church. And so you must be a member of our church. In order to be a member of our church, you have to be baptized. So if you're not baptized here this evening, you're certainly, we would, we would advise you, it would be our counsel not to receive the Lord's Supper this evening. If you're not a member of our church, now there has been a time in my life where uh, we, we, in Bible college, they teach you about three methods or three, uh, who's eligible, and there's three opinions on this. There's open communion as someone practice, and they say anybody can participate in it. You just whoever. And I never believe really, that was good. Never suggested or recommended that. There's also close communion, close. And that's where I had lined up for years. Uh, I lined up there because I felt like if they were a member of another Bible believing, preaching church of the same doctrine, and they happened to be here, or maybe they had not made that transition here yet, but they were members of the church that if they felt that they wanted to receive the Lord's Supper, they could. And I really don't have a bad, big problem with churches that, that observe that way, asserting their, their right as a local, independent church to make their own decisions. But here recently, someone brought up a point to me that really struck home with me. And they said, well, we, our church, they were visiting here, and they said, our church doesn't practice that way because if there was somebody that was not eligible because they were under church discipline, we wouldn't know about it. The only way we're going to know about that is if it's members of our church that are in church discipline. And uh, we believe that if there's, a, if there's a family or an individual that would be in church discipline, which is talking about the book first and it's scriptural. It's not being mean. If there's open sin, it's unconfessed. And then there's church discipline that follows. There's restrictions. And, uh, and for a time until that person is brought back into fellowship. And so for that matter, I, I as a pastor would advise if you're not a member of our church, then not to receive the Lord's Supper. Now that is between you. Paul even says down here uh, in verse number, uh, uh, verse number 28, but let a man examine himself. And so tonight, our ushers, whoever they will be that will assist in this, are not going to be going up and down the aisle and saying, you can and you cannot. Uh, your neighbor that's sitting to the left or right or in front or back, he's not going to be looking around or should not be looking around saying who is taken and who is not. This is a, as personal as we can get it tonight without just being individually, you know, we go into the room separately and we're in a congregation this evening, but your heart and your mind and your eyes ought to be on yourself and yourself alone tonight. Amen. Now, parents, we obviously want you to have some great opportunity for you to train your children and help your children learn about these things. I'm certainly not saying to ignore them, but uh, I'm not going to be looking out here tonight saying you or you should not or should be taking of this. That is between you and the Lord. Let a man examine himself. I've done my best to be honest with you. Tell you what I think the scripture teaches on it. And, uh, and so now from this point on, this is, this is up to you. Uh, will you will you feel that you are worthy to receive of the Lord's Supper this evening? And so tonight, as we do this, we are remembering, we are looking back, and we are remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's not as a backward look. Now, we are also, and I, I really like this, uh, it's an upward look. It's a, it, it's a, it's a future look as, as well. Notice verse number 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Um, that is 
That is another great motivation for us this evening. The reality that we believe in the Lord's return. Um, his first coming was at his, 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 uh, his, his birth, his life here on this earth. And uh, there's coming a day he's coming back again. His rapture. Right. But there's a second coming where Jesus is coming back to this earth. And we look forward to that. He's coming back. And he's coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He already is that. But he's going to come and set up his kingdom here on this earth. And we're going to have the great privilege to, to, to sit under him and to uh, rule with him as, as his children. And certainly what a great thing that is. And we look forward to that. You get sick and tired of what's going on all around us in this world? Keep looking forward. Keep looking to the future. Even if we live, uh, as one, we just went to the men's conference the other day, one of the men gave the example, even if we live 100 years, that's nothing in comparison to eternity. And we have the, the, the great hope, the great future, and we look forward to the Lord's coming. When will that be? I, I, I just don't know. We're not told when that will be. We're not given a time of when that will be. But we look forward to it, and we, and we, and we are anxious for it. I remember as a young man growing up, and perhaps my children or your kids, may feel the same way. But there was a time when my dad would say, oh, I wish the Lord would come back. And there may have been a part of me at that point in my life as an 18-year-old or even into my college years. Well, I'd like to get married first. Or I, you know, some of these things, I'd like to experience some of the things of life. And that's pretty natural for us to feel that way. But the older I get, the more I see in this world, the, the less I feel that way. And I'm looking forward to this return. Amen. I must admit there are sometimes there's an anxious feeling about it because of the unknown. We just have the scriptures to tell us a little insight into it that John had a hard time even describing. In the book of Revelation, what heaven was going to be like and that, and that vivid vision the Lord gave him. But I trust God. And it must be good. Right. He's going to prepare a place for us. And we look forward to that. And so... Tonight, not only are we looking back to remember his death, burial, and resurrection, what a wonderful thing that was, but we're also looking forward to till he comes. And uh, let us tonight have that in our thoughts as well. He is coming back. And uh, we'll know when, but he is. We'll, re we'll, we'll, we'll remember that. So this evening, what I'd like to do is just to have a, just a time of prayer. Silent prayer tonight. We won't have the piano to play at this school. I want everybody to have an opportunity to talk to God, to pray. And certainly, if you would, if someone would like to, to come to the altar this evening, that would certainly be fine. That's between you and God. If you want to come to the altar this evening, this altar is here for you. If you need someone to pray with you tonight, we would love to provide that for you. As always, if there will be someone here that would recognize tonight that you're not saved, or one of might to get saved. There would be not a greater time. If you felt the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your heart, uh, don't say, oh, I shouldn't do that now. Yes, you should. Yeah. We will take the time gladly. And uh, the tornadoes will rip around this building, and we'll get that salvation taken care of. And then we'll observe the Lord's Supper. So there's plenty of time for that. We will always make time for that. So if you need someone to pray with you tonight, let me know. But in the quietness of this moment, with our heads bowed our eyes closed, I'd like you to do a couple of things here. First of all, I'd like to look inward and say, is there anything in my heart that would hinder me tonight from not receiving the Lord's Supper? Is there a sin? I'm going to remind you of the seriousness of this. Paul says here in this passage of Scripture, because you received it unworthily, for this cause many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep or have died. Um, I know the Lord's a gracious God, but we want to take the word of God literally here this evening. And for you to knowingly receive this with your heart not right with God is a dangerous situation. So I encourage you tonight to be sure that things are right in your heart. Perhaps tonight you would consider your relationship with God, your relationship with man. Now just because not everything is right with you and another individual, doesn't mean you can't be right in that matter. You have 
attempted to have things right. We are right with the Lord in this matter. And so I don't want you to be afraid to receive the Lord's Supper just because maybe someone's mad at you. There's an issue there. You know your heart this evening. Look, is your relationship with the Lord right? Is your relationship with fellow man right? Are you running from God from anything right now? Has God been working in your heart and you've been avoiding Him? Is your relationship right? Please consider these things as well as the, the matters that we discussed earlier. So at this point in time, let's pray together. You pray silently and in just a moment I'll close this in prayer and we'll receive the Lord's Son.